Legends Di Fiori, and this is Black Ball. It is a Black Ball doubleheader today. Uh, we have our show right now, and then later on tonight, I have my Black Ball Sunday report with former fixer David Wallace. And it is a good time to speak with uh, people all around the political sphere, whether they are in the game, used to be in the game, or nibbled the edges because of what is happening in our province. Our province is dealing with what I consider to be one of the most clear-cut cases of corruption and conflict of interest that I think I've ever seen uh, in, in, in the last 20 years at least, just in the way that it's been executed and also in the way where I feel condescended as a citizen of this province when I look at the Green Belt scandal and I look at the people involved and we are being asked to buy into this idea that a chief of staff who happens to be, I was told, I'll say allegedly so I don't get sued, who happens to be the boyfriend of the housing minister's daughter was the point man in granting uh, these developers their deals in regards to the green, in, in regards to the green belt, and he just coincidentally happened to give all these deals to the half the people on the wedding guest of his of Doug Ford's daughter's wedding. I find the whole thing to be offensive, and I wanted someone here who has had experience in political office, especially when it comes to the province. Um, she is the former MPP of Parkdale High Park. She's also the author of The Queer Evangelist, a, social, a Socialist Clergy's Radically Honest Tale. Please welcome to the show, friend of the show now, she's been on three times, her name is Sherry Genova. Sherry, how are you? I'm good, James, always a pleasure. How are you? you? And I love your intro, by the way, it's fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that, shout out to Zach Fax, uh, who, who did the beat and uh, who did the graphics for the intro. Um, I'm really, really happy to have you here today because there is so much happening and it's nice to get a perspective from somebody who was elected in this province, who has seen, you know, some of the good, bad and the ugly firsthand. I want you to help me understand if my um, cynical take on this situation is accurate. Am I going too far? Is the process flawed, like Doug Ford likes to say? What are we watching unfold in front of us? Well, certainly the process is flawed. I mean, I can say that right off the bat. Um, it's called corruption and graft, of course. Um, it's interesting. My very first uh, year in politics, and that was 2006 when I was elected, it was a liberal government back then. And I used to joke with my benchmate, Peter Tabins, and say, you know, uh, you know, er every day it's, it's kind of graft and corruption. And it's a good day when somebody doesn't get whacked, sort of the line from a, you know, Sopranos episode. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, oh, no, don't say that. He said, when I was at City Hall, speaking about Toronto, uh, when I was at City Hall, somebody did get shot in the in the parking lot. So I thought, wow. what? So and that was under the Liberal government. Uh, they had just given away through the back door at the end of the budget session, like a million dollars to a cricket club, 15 million here, willy nilly, et cetera. I mean, it was, it was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. And that was such small potatoes when you think about the Ford government. I mean, 8.3 billion. And that's just the beginning, because really, this has never been about housing. This is about giving, you know, donors to the Conservative Party um, the inside uh, listings. Um, but I mean, what's interesting about it is that it's already clear that they bought the land to flip it. So you see that coming up. So it's not just 8.3 billion. It's actually many times that. And it's our land, right? Like we own it. So, I mean, there you see it there, you see it at Ontario Place, um, you see it at the Science Centre, you see it in, in pretty much everything that Ford's government touches right now. But yes, the Green Belt is a shocker still. Yeah, there, there is, there's so many ancillary details about all this that make it really uncomfortable and really kind of offensive. Um, one of those things, uh, that value that you were talking about, they're talking north of 20 billion probably, the value of this, uh, mm -hmm. of this land. I remember when McGinty um, helped sort of establish the lines for the green belt and reading a story. I thought, I think it was in the Toronto star. I wish, I wish I remembered who wrote it. Cause it was a good column. And they said, if you want to know where housing is going to be built in the future, just look at the green belt. 
because apparently when it was being drawn out, there were loopholes already embedded inside the actual uh, deal to begin with. Like this protected land was never really going to be protected. Is that your understanding as well? Well, well, certainly, listen, um, you know, liberal Tories, same old stories. I, I don't, you know, credit the McGinty with writing good legislation. I mean, another example of really bad legislation that, that sadly they took my bill and put a poison pill in it was inclusionary zoning. Um, if we actually had inclusionary zoning and say 10 to 15 or percent even of every new development had to be deeply affordable housing we would not have homeless crisis um so they you know at that time the the housing minister said he was passing it and then much later we found this poison pill that allowed the ford government to just put a kibosh on all inclusionary zoning essentially um because it had to go through them so i mean i i don't you know i i don't hold either in high esteem um but ford has certainly you know uh Ford has certainly, you know, set a new low bar. And, and it's interesting because of the characters involved too. Like Steve Clark was known for calling for the resignation of cabinet ministers when they were in opposition. That was like his, you know, his yeah. raise on death there. Um, he's kind of, you were to meet Steve, he's a nice guy. Like I've, he's been in my house. He was singing karaoke here, I think when, <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, it's a small town at Queens Park, right? Yeah. Um, and he's clearly not... Like, here's the thing. And the NDP is calling for his resignation. I mean, we should be calling for Doug Ford's resignation. I mean, it, in fact, we should be calling for criminal investigation. And first and foremost, we should be calling to give the land back. I mean, that's the critical mm -hmm. demand. Because, you know, you can have staffers resign, Steve Clark resign. I mean, to me, the best political move and the most ethical move Steve could do is simply tell the truth you know, tell the truth about the fact that Doug Ford clearly knew everything that was going on. I mean, of course he did. Yeah. Um, resign, leave the party, sit as an independent and make his political career as somebody who actually tells the truth. That's kind of his only out now. I gather he's hired a lawyer, which is kind of weird. For what? <laughs> um, who's investigating too? I mean, that's another question. It shows how completely useless the OPP and possibly the RCMP are in actually, you know, uh, keeping criminals to account. I mean, if you or I stole a thousand dollars, we'd be sitting in prison right now. Um, but they can steal, you know, upwards of eight point three billion at the very least, and and just you know dust it off their shoulders like where where is the law when it comes to to actions like this steve clark is interesting i, I think uh, i i saw the clip that you might be referring to where he stood up at queen's park and i don't know who he was directing it towards i don't remember it was 2018 i think the clip was from and he was talking about how um basically if you're if you have a good ethical center you, and you're under investigation you should resign and it was interesting to hear him say that and, and then flip to what's happening now. You had an interesting tweet as well when you said, so Steve Clark has hired a lawyer for what? The best way to deal, the best way to deal is to tell the truth about what Doug actually knew and vetted while resigning from his post and his party. Now, finally, Steve, time to tell the truth. We all know he didn't decide this without Ford. I agree with that assessment. I'm also curious if this is a case, and I tweeted something like this the other day, where Doug Ford, um, you know, keep your friends close, but your potential whistleblowers closer. Is that one of the reasons you think why he doesn't want uh, Steve Clark, to, why he hasn't fired Steve Clark? Well, probably, but it's not doing Steve any good, right? Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. everybody knows the reality here. Anybody, and you know, you, you, I mean, honestly, you don't have to be a political scientist to understand what happened. I mean, no minister is going to act unilaterally you know, without the say-so of the premier or the prime minister, depending on what level of government. I mean, they're just not going to do it. They never do it. Um, it's, it, you know, the, do they make mistakes? Um, uh, small ones, yes, uh, without being vetted, but not big ones, not like this. I mean, this is clearly a giveaway to donors to the Conservative Party. I mean, if you want to look at good lobbying, you look at, as you said, the guest, guest list for Doug Ford's daughter's wedding, you know. That's good lobbying. I mean, it has nothing to do with Queen's Park, has everything to do with who your friends are. Um, and and, I, and interestingly, one of the comments I saw is, you know, um, from Linda Ems, you know, we do own the land, but 
you know, not, of course, it is uns probably unceded indigenous land too. Um, and of course, they're, they're also screaming about this and the fact that they weren't consulted well, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, he's, he's breaking any number of laws here, including Planning Act, you know, um, laws. So th there's no question of what's happened. Um, the Ethics Commissioner has made it very clear. Um, the Auditor General, Lesser Cotton Socks, Bonnie, love her, too bad she's gone, um, uh, made it very clear what's going on. The question is, what are we going to do about it? What's going to happen from this? That's the question. I would like to ask you a question from a perspective of a person who's clearly not a political scientist. I'm wearing a polyester blazer with a T-shirt. I'm not a person who knows a lot about this stuff, right? Also, it's really hot in here. Um, but I, I would like to, to know, what it is, what is it about the way that governments are run where things that seem quite obvious, like it used to be that the even the appearance of potential impropriety was of a conflict of interest was enough for people to, to shy away from it. Why is it, and this is, might sound really ignorant for someone who is not educated in this area, but why is it that when, I, I feel like when someone's elected to, uh, to a high office like the premier or the prime ministership, that when he's vetted, that if he has personal friends that run businesses, then those businesses can't get a piece of the of the government pie. Is, does that exist? Am I completely naive? Or No, it does exist. There are lots of rules around it. And in fact, every elected member of provincial parliament in Ontario every year has to sit down with the ethics commissioner uh, or the integrity commissioner and go over everything you own. Like how much do you have in your house? What stocks do you own? Because of potential conflict of interest. So how absurd it is that this guy, Ford, can get away with this in the light of the routine practice of the House, the legislature. Um, and the, the simple answer is majority government. I mean, we have a system where it's very not easy, but it can be done to get majority government. If you are a majority government, you can do anything you want. Bottom line, you can change the laws, you can do anything you want. Um, and Doug Ford is, he has indicated that time and time again, totally changed the way we run the city of Toronto and could again. You know, um, so so again, a majority government is a dictatorship. The only recourse we really have at the end of the day, if they're not going to do what's right, <laughs> is um, to not vote for them the next time. And that's not good enough. You know, that's a couple of years away. So yeah. um, so it, it really puts to, to the question the way that we do government. And of course, part of that problem is first past the post, you know, so mm. again. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, now, just to just to sort of uh, see this uh, scandal to its uh, current, its present day, um, its present day situation where the RCMP looks like they may get involved. How confident are you that the RCMP is going to conduct a robust investigation into the Ford government based on uh, the information that we've had so far? Well, we know the uh, propensity politically of both the OPP and the RCMP. A good example is the RCMP has been investigating Jason Kenney since 2017. Wonder how that's going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so yeah. So, I mean, what, what will happen is maybe they'll open a file and, and people will forget about it and the next election will come and go independent of this. And the, and the real hope we have is that people do not forget what's happened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the OPP, you know, aren't they supposed to be working for us, like not for Doug Ford and the Conservative Party? They're supposed to be working for the people of Ontario, right? If, if I guess we, not. I guess not is the simple answer there. I guess we, not. We skipped the OPP when we talked about this. I didn't see many uh, reports about how the OPP might get involved. Does everyone just sort of feel that the OPP is already kind of in the bag, in the tank for the Ford government? They give him like escorted uh, trips to Muskoka and everything like are we, I are mean, we like how, and, and by the, the way gravy how plane, jaded does the that gravy make plane us? scandal the yes gravy plane yeah how, how jaded does that make us where we're just like oh the OPP is not going to do anything about it and then we just kind of move on you well know? I mean this is this is both you know the, the reality and also the danger right is that you can get very very cynical and boy oh boy is it easy with the political process um especially now right but the problem is the answer to to that is get out and do something not sit back and do nothing because then they just win again mm -hmm. so you know the call is to action the call is to um shows like this and keep talking about it keep it in the mix 
and keep it in the mix until the next election. Do not let people forget. I mean, this is only one of many things they've done, of course. I mean, they're privatizing our education and healthcare system. They're destroying our, edu our public services. Um, that's what they're doing. Uh, I mean, look at the homelessness situation. Look at the housing. Talk about housing. We have 65,000 empty units in Toronto right now, just sitting empty. They're being used as investments, right? Um, we've got tons of empty commercial space since COVID sitting empty, used not even as investments. They're not even good investments. This could all be housing. Uh, on any main street in Toronto, now you'll see boarded up buildings. You know, this is, again, uh, a decision, a political decision of the way to run our town. And this is throughout the province, too. Um, so it's not a question of housing. It's never been a question of housing. I mean, I, I was a housing critic when I was first elected for many years and talk about an exercise in frustration. Um, at that point, we showed the then housing minister, who was a liberal, that it cost more to keep somebody in a shelter, literally more dollars on paper than to put them in a hotel, a nice hotel at that. Wow. Um, and that's still the case, right? Um, because when you're putting them in, in a shelter, you've got staff, you've got everything else, you're putting up beds, blah, blah, blah. It's an expensive proposition. This is absurd. This is completely ridiculous. So when you look at how ridiculous the response to housing has been for many different governments, um, then you have to say, I don't believe anything a politician says about housing. Show me. Show me the new bills. Show me the real rent control, which the Conservative government have voted again, uh, against time and time again. Show me, um, show me using all these empty units. Show me the taxes, the luxury taxes. I mean, there's hope that Olivia will, will do something. I'm hoping she will. It looks like she might. But the city's uh, prospects are very limited in comparison to the, the provincial and federal governments on housing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I haven't lived in Toronto in, in about six and a half years or so. And I, I remember I lived in the beaches and there were so many boarded up stores in the beaches. And I know this is commercial and not residential, but it's, it's in the same milieu. But they, uh, when I found out, I, I asked uh, my, I actually asked uh, uh, Nathaniel Erskine Smith, who was my MP at the time. Um, I just ran into him and I, I just asked him a question about it. And he's like, there's loopholes where they don't, if they keep it empty, they don't have to pay any property tax on it. And I was just like, are you serious? <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean, if they yeah. keep it empty, they don't have to have the you know hassle of tenants and they get to write it off as a loss. And a lot of these properties are, or, uh, are owned by consortiums. They're investment vehicles, really. They're not yeah. seen as property. So right. this is the problem. So hence the death of our main streets. It's going to be the death of our downtown too, quite frankly, um, because since COVID, why rent all this expensive office space when you can have your workers work from home? So, I mean, again, um, there's all sorts of problems there which they have no interest in fixing. Um, we know that whatever the, you know, the gloss over the Green Belt scandal was about housing would have been um, suburban sprawl, so terrible for the environment, um, probably McMansions of one sort or another. And this is not deeply affordable housing. This is not the housing we need. And how are you gonna get from the Green Belt? To, like, you know, where do, you, where do the jobs exist for those Green Belt house, you know, home buyers? So, so again, this is really problematic and it's just, it, you know, it's just BS actually. I mean, like every time a politician opens their, their mouth and talks about housing, I just like, you wanna scream liar, you know? <laughs> As the former housing critic, um, uh, mm -hmm. and I remember that now that you told me, I, I was, you just reminded me that you were that. I, I find it, um, and again, this is one of those things that's way above my pay grade, but it just seems to me that the cost of living and the rate of inflation and the Bank of Canada interest rate, all of these things happen on a relatively linear scale and they all kind of coincide with one another. And then real estate value just dwarfs all of them. Is it considered like the only part of our economy that is allowed to exist in its own sphere of unfettered capitalism where banks run it? Uh, because people always say, well, it's the homeowners. And it's like, listen, anytime that you have an entire piece of the economy run only by banks, and that's the only thing that rarely ever loses value, something's going on, right? I mean, so what, what, what is there what sort of solutions um, can you apply to it where people won't yell at you that you're a communist or a socialist? Like, like what, what are you, what are we able to do to sort of stave that off? Cause it feels like downtown Toronto, if it's not already sort of like that in like 20 years, does anyone that lives uh, between like Dufferin and, you know, Broadview, Bloor and the lake, are any of them not going to be like millionaires? Like how, how is this going to work? 
Yeah, but, but here's the thing. I mean, and the banks raising interest rates, um, the question is, how, how exactly does that combat inflation? If anybody's gone to the grocery store, yeah. um, you know where inflation resides. It's in, you know, greedflation. It's, it's, you know, companies that have made billions during COVID, you know, we're talking big oil and gas, we're talking the grocery chains. They made billions by, by cranking up their prices with all sorts of flimsy excuses as to why. They're certainly not paying, you know, their workers much more. Um, and when the banks raise raise the rates, who does that hurt? Well, it hurts most homeowners who have huge mortgages. You know, if they own a home at all, it hurts anybody who has debt, which is, you know, the again, we're not talking about the super wealthy here. We're not talking about the billionaires or even the multimillionaires. We're talking about working class people. So that's who it's hurting. Um, that's why some countries haven't taken that tact at all. Um, but that's the reality. The reality is we live in late uh, stage capitalism. And I'm bring it on, call me a socialist. I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's what we need. Um, and, and just seeing some um, some of the comments here, uh, I, and I don't want to breed cynicism. I mean, I happen to think that, you know, we've, we've finally elected, I you know, a really great leader in Mart Stiles um, at Queen's Park and as opposition leader. So um, there, it, there are alternatives to Doug Ford um, that would be better. There's no question in my mind about that. Um, so, so, you know, do vote yes to the comments. Uh, yes, do vote. Please get active. I get very active and, and talk across the aisle. Like we, you know, we tend to preach to our choirs, right. Um, or get, go down our own rabbit holes. Like we really need to start to talk to people who vote conservative. We really need to get out of our comfort zones, whether they be relatives or neighbors or people you work with who don't agree with you on various topics. Instead of just thinking, oh, they're an, an idiot, you know, let's actually talk to them because um, because that's how things really change is when those kinds of changes take place. Um, Polly Ebb's going to win. He's going to win by a landslide if you know federal polls continue. Um, and who's voting for him? A lot of people that are going to be way worse off when he gets elected. Um, so again, when you're looking at class-based politics, let's talk to the people who work for a living and you know show them the facts. Like we all should be educators, you know, about the political process uh, because that's the only way we're going to change. Otherwise, we'll have conservative governments coast to coast to coast, and Doug Ford will get reelected again. Yikes. Yeah. I agree what you're saying about talking across the aisle. I, I think, and and especially in a way where the, if you're talking, if you're speaking to a person who votes conservative, don't don't say conservative as if you're replacing the word asshole. Like like you know, give the give give, give people room to talk so that they can be themselves. Um, I have two two more questions. One of them has to do with I, I'm just going to just to tie a bow around the, the the municipal part of this and banks and real estate. Is part of the problem is that there there often is not much of an appetite at the municipal level to sort of deal with rising real estate and out of reach prices for regular people because of how much we rely on property taxes to fill our municipal coffers? Well, absolutely and partly, but also when you look at property taxes, um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, they again should, and Olivia's got the right um, stance on this, is we should be raising taxes on luxury properties. And we should be looking more at speculation and consortiums that own multiple properties and looking at those. We should certainly raise the tax on empty properties. I mean, that should not be allowed. Um, that's just to use a property as an investment tool and not as housing. That's wrong. Um, that should not be allowed. So again, housing should be housing. And, um, and we should be looking at real serious inclusionary zoning. So if you're going to build a, a huge condo building, you got to make at least 10 to 15 percent of it deeply affordable, not just below market rent, but affordable to somebody on ODSP. Or, you know, that that will get rid of our homelessness problem very, very quickly without even a new build. But we need to build new as well. We need all of these. And and by the way, other jurisdictions have done this. Many of when I was in Sweden, smaller than Ontario, they were building 100,000 new units a year. I mean, it's not this is not, you know, unknown. Other other jurisdictions do it and they do it well. And just to the conservative point, I think that's an important one, James, because I want us all talking to conservatives, even though it's difficult, um, is that, you know, when I grew up in the city, uh, on one salary, you could own a home, probably own it outright in your lifetime, a car in the driveway, which you would own um, on one salary, on one salary. Yeah. And, you know, if you were on social assistance, and I was, 
as a kid, you could rent a, like an apartment, a small apartment or a room. You could feed yourself. You could survive and go to school or do something, right? Yep. Um, and that was under conservative governments, federally, provincially, and municipally. I like to remind conservatives of that. One of the best building projects, maybe the best in in city of Toronto, was redevelopment of St. Lawrence Market. There you've got co-op housing, you've got um, so you know assisted housing, and you've got market housing. All you can't tell the difference between them, and it's all great. You know, it's not a it's not a ghetto. It's like a mixed neighborhood that was built from basically scrap. So we know how to do it. We've done it before, and we've done it even under conservatives. But that's not the Conservative Party we have now. So no, and you know what's you're you're absolutely right about that. I I lived in your riding. I lived on Cowan Avenue when I lived in Parkdale, and what I really loved about uh, that neighborhood is what some stuffier people didn't like about it. There were these two high rises, right, right before you got to Roncesvalles, and it created such an amazing cultural motif on Queen Street where it was like Ethiopian restaurants and Indian restaurants and the, the groups of people that would intermingle were all kind of from walking from different walks of life. And it wasn't perfect by any means, but it was, it, it was, it was cultural. Like it felt like a community. And I feel like now when you walk into the annex, it's, it's not like that anymore, you know? And a lot of those houses in the annex were those places that you were talking about where in the fifties and sixties and seventies, people can have one job and raise a family in houses that are now housing four different apartments. Right. Like and, and all yeah. these apartments are worth twenty five hundred dollars now. Like it's crazy. Or more. Yeah. My the house I grew up in on Bedford Road, uh, my parents ran as a rooming house back then um, is now three luxury condos. Yeah. So that gives you an indication of the annex um, in Park Del High, we, we, we affectionately call Park Del High Park the Socialist Republic of Park Del High Park. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, it is true that we had about 10,000 units of affordable housing down in Jameson, which we called the landing strip because it was so heavily in new immigrants, a uh, lot of Tibetans. So we're a little Tibet yeah. now along Queen Street. The problem with that is rent evictions. The problem with that yeah. is that somebody moves out all of a sudden the rent gets jacked up or they put on new balconies or they fix up the foyer and then they go to the, the tribunal and they get a huge increase in rent so they can get beyond the rent control even as it stands. So when, you know, when I first started into politics and was canvassing those areas, a lot of people couldn't vote because they weren't citizens yet. Now they're young kind of hipsters, like three people sharing an apartment, um, paying twice what those immigrants paid who, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is the gentrification of our inner city and um, and it's sad and, and it just leads to more and more homelessness. So, you know, we're becoming inured to it, which is deeply unethical. Yeah, no, I agree. My last question I think is a big question because I struggle with this uh, and I know that, it, it, you know, in your soul, I know you believe in, in civilian action. I am pretty pessimistic as to how effective traditional protests are these days i just we're so polarized um the the convoy protest in ottawa pissed off most of the country um a lot of us didn't agree with why they were there a lot of us felt that it was way too much with the honking and everything like that but to be honest with you uh when i see guillotines uh at, at queen's park and and that kind of stuff from the left i also kind of feel like eh, I don't like blocking traffic. I, I'm trying to figure out what is a, an effective way for people to come out by the thousands and actually do something where the government takes them seriously, where they won't get dismissed by their political opposites. Um, well, the best example of that was the education workers who went on a wildcat strike, who shut the province down, who got the government to the table. The best thing that could happen in this province right now is a general strike. Now, we're not talking about just willy nilly demonstrations over this or that issue. We're talking about organized labor and lots of them and all of them coming out. Imagine if we did that. Imagine if we, you know, when we think about nurses, for example, they were on strike in the UK and they were on strike in New York. Well, we can't live without nurses. Sorry. So if everybody came out, the government would be forced, forced to the table and forced to negotiate. And that's the best I can see. So if you're not in a union, get in the union or unionize. Um, and if you are in a union, please, 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 you know, vote for some executive that will say, let's take to the streets because it's the only thing we're listening to these days. 
um, and that is effective protest. Um, mm. So I'd say, you know, the higher unionization rate, again, in Scandinavian countries and in Sweden used to be 85%, it's now 67%, I think, but still remarkably high. So McDonald's is unionized. This gives you power. And it's the only thing that gives you power in this system. Um, Sherry DeNovo, I, I always appreciate your time. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, my daughter just informed me that her ride is here, so I need to go say goodbye, <laughs> but I was going to end it there anyways, because that was my final question. Listen, I would love to have you back anytime you want to come back to talk about this stuff, because I, I absolutely respect your opinion. You are uh, a trailblazer as far as I'm concerned, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, so much, so much fun, James, and to everyone, thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye now. Uh, Sherry Genova, everybody, and I'm going to spare you a, a, a long-winded outro, except to say that I love that woman a lot, and uh, I am uh, on at, I think, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock tonight with David Wallace for my Sunday report, and we'll see you next time on Black Ball. Black 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 Black